Story two of Wounds in the Rain War Stories by Stephen Crane. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story two The Lone Charge of William B. Perkins. He could not distinguish between a five inch quick firing gun and a nickel plated ice pick, and so naturally he had been elected to fill the position of war correspondent. The responsible party was the editor of the Minnesota Herald. Perkins had no information of war and no particular rapidity of mind for acquiring it, but he had that rank and fibrous quality of courage which springs from the thick soil of western America. It was morning in Guantanamo Bay. If the Marines encamped on the hill had had time to turn their gaze seaward, they might have seen a small newspaper dispatch boat wending its way toward the entrance of the harbor over the blue sunlit waters of the Caribbean. In the stern of this tug, Perkins was seated upon some coal bags while the breeze gently ruffled his greasy pajamas. He was staring at a brown line of entrenchments surmounted by a flag, which was Camp McCalla. In the harbor were anchored two or three grim gray cruisers and a transport. As the tug steamed up the radiant channel, Perkins could see men moving on shore near the charred ruins of a village. Perkins was deeply moved. Here already was more war than he had ever known in Minnesota. Presently, he, clothed in the essential garments of a war correspondent, was rowed to the sandy beach. Marines in yellow linen were handling an ammunition supply. They paid no attention to the visitor, being morose from the inconveniences of two days and nights of fighting. Perkins toiled up the zigzag path to the top of the hill, and looked with eager eyes at the trenches, the field pieces, the funny little colts, the flag the grim marines lying wearily on their arms. And still more he looked through the clear air over a thousand yards of mysterious woods, from which emanated at inopportune times repeated flocks of Mauser bullets. Perkins was delighted. He was filled with admiration for these jaded and smoky men, who lay so quietly in the trenches waiting for a resumption of guerrilla enterprise but he wished they would heed him. He wanted to talk about it. Save for sharp, inquiring glances, no one acknowledged his existence. Finally he approached two young lieutenants, and in his innocent western way he asked them if they would like a drink. The effect on the two young lieutenants was immediate and astonishing. With one voice they answered, "'Yes, we would!' Perkins almost wept with joy at this amiable response, and he exclaimed that he would immediately board the tug and bring off a bottle of scotch. This attracted the officers, and in a burst of confidence, one explained that there had not been a drop in camp. Perkins lunged down the hill and fled to his boat, where, in his exuberance, he engaged in a preliminary altercation with some whiskey. Consequently, he toiled again up the hill in the blasting sun, with his enthusiasm in no ways abated. The parched officers were very gracious, and such was the state of mind of Perkins that he did not note properly how serious and solemn was his engagement with the whiskey. And because of this fact, and because of his antecedents, there happened the lone charge of William B. Perkins. Now, as Perkins went down the hill, something happened. A private in those high trenches found that a cartridge was clogged in his rifle. It then becomes necessary with most kinds of rifles to explode the cartridge. The private took the rifle to his captain and explained the case. But it would not do in that camp to fire a rifle for mechanical purposes and without warning, because the eloquent sound would bring six hundred tired marines to tension and high expectancy. So the captain turned and in a loud voice announced to the camp that he found it necessary to shoot into the air. The communication rang sharply from voice to voice. Then the captain raised the weapon and fired. Whereupon, and whereupon, a large line of guerrillas lying in the bushes decided swiftly that their presence and position were discovered, 
and swiftly they volleyed. In a moment the woods and the hills were alive with the crack and sputter of rifles. Men on the warships in the harbor heard the old familiar flut flut fluttery flut 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 from the entrenchments. Incidentally, the launch of the Marblehead, commanded by one of our headlong American ensigns, streaked for the strategic woods like a galloping marine dragoon, peppering away with its blunderbuss in the bow. Perkins had arrived at the foot of the hill, where began the arrangement of a hundred and fifty marines that protected the short line of communication between the main body and the beach. These men had all swarmed into line behind fortifications improvised from the boxes of provisions, and to them were gathering naked men who had been bathing, naked men who arrayed themselves speedily in cartridge belts and rifles. The woods and the hills went flut, flut, flut fluttery, flut, flut, fluttery, flut. Under the boughs of a beautiful tree lay five wounded men, thinking vividly and now it befell Perkins to discover a Spaniard in the bush. The distance was some five hundred yards. In a loud voice he announced his perception. He also declared hoarsely that if he only had a rifle he would go and possess himself of this particular enemy. Immediately an amiable lad shot in the arm said, Well, take mine. Perkins thus acquired a rifle and a clip of five cartridges. Come on, he shouted. This part of the battalion was lying very tight, not yet being engaged, but not knowing when the business would swirl around to them. To Perkins they replied with a roar, "'Come back here, you blank fool! Do you want to get shot by your own crowd? Come back, blank, blank!' As a detail, it might be mentioned that the fire from a part of the hill swept the journey upon which Perkins had started." Now behold the solitary Perkins adrift in the storm of fighting, even as a champagne jacket of straw is lost in a great surf. He found it out quickly. Four seconds elapsed before he discovered that he was an almshouse idiot plunging through hot, crackling thickets on a June morning in Cuba. Swing, singing, pop! went the lightning-swift metal grasshoppers over him and beside him. The beauties of rural Minnesota illuminated his conscience with the gold of lazy corn, with the sleeping green of meadows, with the cathedral gloom of pine forests. Shwip, swing, pop! Perkins decided that if he cared to extract himself from a tangle of imbecility, he must shoot. The entire situation was that he must shoot. It was necessary that he should shoot. Nothing would save him but shooting. It is a law that men thus decide when the waters of battle close over their minds. So, with a prayer that the Americans would not hit him in the back, nor the left side, and that the Spaniards would not hit him in the front, he knelt like a supplicant alone in the desert of Chaparral, and emptied his magazine at his Spaniard before he discovered that his Spaniard was a bit of dried palm branch. Then Perkins flurried like a fish. His reason for being was a Spaniard in the bush. When the Spaniard turned into a dried palm branch, he could no longer furnish himself with one adequate reason. Then did he dream frantically of some anthracite hiding-place, some profound dungeon of peace, where blind mules live placidly, chewing the far-gathered hay. Swing, bing, pop, prut, prut, prut. Then a field-gun spoke. Boom, ra, swa, ra, 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 boom. Then a colt automatic began to bark. Crack, 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 endlessly. Raked enfiladed, flanked, surrounded, and overwhelmed, what hope was there for William B. Perkins of the Minnesota Herald? But war is a spirit. War provides for those that it loves. It provides sometimes death, and sometimes a singular and incredible safety. There were few ways in which it was possible to preserve Perkins. One way was by means of a steam-boiler. Perkins espied near him an old, rusty steam-boiler lying in the bushes. War only knows how it was there, but there it was, a temple shining resplendent with safety. 
With a moan of haste, Perkins flung himself through that hole which expressed the absence of the steam pipe. Then, ensconced in his boiler, Perkins comfortably listened to the ring of a fight which seemed to be in the air above him. Sometimes bullets struck their strong, swift blow against the boiler's sides, but none entered to interfere with Perkins' rest. Time passed. The fight, short anyhow, dwindled to prut, 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 prut. And when the silence came, Perkins might have been seen cautiously protruding from the boiler. Presently he strolled back toward the marine lines with his hat not able to fit his head for a few bumps of wisdom that were on it. The marines, with an annoyed air, were settling down again when an apparitional figure came from the bushes. There was great excitement. "'It's that crazy man!' they shouted, and as he drew near they gathered tumultuously about him and demanded to know how he had accomplished it. Perkins made a gesture, the gesture of a man escaping from an unintentional mud-bath, the gesture of a man coming out of battle, and then he told them. The incredulity was immediate and general. Yes, you did. What? In an old boiler? An old boiler? Out in that brush? Well, we guess not. They did not believe him until two days later, when a patrol happened to find the rusty boiler, relic of some curious transaction in the ruin of the Cuban sugar industry. The patrol then marveled at the truthfulness of war correspondence until they were almost blind. Soon after his adventure, Perkins boarded the tug, wearing a countenance of poignant thoughtfulness. End of section three.